Hi everyone, welcome back to Fit 2, or Part 2, of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Now, when we left off with our boy Sir Gawain, he had been challenged by the Green Knight to a hit-for-a-hit contest, right? And um, he'd hit first, he decapitated the Green Knight, who then walked over, picked up his head, and said, See you at the Green Chapel next year where I get to cut off your head fun times. So we're picking up, this is a year later, where it's as the year is turning, we're going to see. And um, Sir Gawain is starting to realize he is going to have to go to find where the Green Chapel is and go face this, well, death. Okay. So flip in your PDF to page 19, and where it says fit the second or fit two. Okay, and here we go. This happened was a gift, just as Arthur had asked for, and had yearned to hear of while the year was young. And if guests had no subject as they strolled to their seats, now they chattered of Gowan's chances in this challenge. Right, so this is, this is still at the Christmas dinner. We're going to see the year progress in a minute, and they're all talking about what happened with Gawain. And Gowan had been glad to begin the game, but don't be so shocked should the plot turn pear-shaped. Now, pear-shaped is an English phrase, meaning it's not going to go very well. For men may be merry when addled with mead, but each year, short-lived, is unlike the last, and rarely resolves in the style it arrived. So, the festive finishes and the new year follows, in eternal sequence, season by season. After lavish Christmas come the lean days of Lent, when the flesh is tested with fish and simple food. Okay, so 40 days before Easter, right? Um, Christians, particularly Catholics, celebrate Lent, where they fast and they often don't eat meat and they pray a lot. Then the world's weather wages war on winter. Cold shrinks earthward and the clouds climb. Sun warmed and shimmering rain comes showering. Onto meadows and fields where flowers unfurl, woods and grounds where a wardrobe of green. Birds burble into, with life and build busily as summer spreads, settling on slopes it should. Now every hedgerow brims with blossom and with bud, and lively songbirds sing from lovely leafy woods. So summer comes in season with its subtle airs, when the west wind sighs among shoots and seeds, and those plants which flower and flourish are a pleasure, as their leaves let drip their drink of dew, and they sparkle, I lost my place there for a second, uh, and they sparkle and glitter when glanced by sunlight. Isn't this beautiful description for the changing of the seasons? And it's really cinematic. You can really see it in your head, these seasons changing. Then autumn arrives to harden the harvest and with it comes a warning to ripen before winter the drying airs arrive driving up dust from the face of the earth to the heights of heaven and the wild sky wrestles the sun with its winds and the leaves of the lime lay littered on the ground and grass that was green turns withered and gray then all which has risen over ripens and rots Ooh. And yesterday on yesterday, the year dies away. Oh, I love that. That's a great phrase. Yesterday on yesterday, the year dies away. As we're entering the new year and we're entering December, remember that phrase. That's a good one. And winter returns, as is the way of the world, through time. At Michaelmas, the moon stands like that season's sign, a warning to Gawain to rouse himself and ride. So now it's been a whole year and Gawain knows he's got to head out. Yet, by All Saints' Day, he was still at Arthur's side, and they feasted in the name of their noble knight. Now, All Saints' Day is um, November 1st. Um, uh, if you have, if you come from a Latino or Mexican tradition and you have... Um, all Saints Day or Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, which is All Souls Day, which is usually November 2nd. Um, that celebration of people who've passed before you. So now we're at November 1st. 
he was still at Arthur's side, and they feasted in the name of their noble knight, with the revels and riches of the round table. The lords of that hall and their loving ladies were sad and concerned for their knight, but nevertheless they made light of his load. Those joyless at his plight made jokes and rejoiced. Okay, have you ever done that? Like your friend is going through a hard time or you know they're going to have to go through something really hard. And so to kind of lighten them up, you kind of joke, even though you're sad too. Then, sorrowfully, after supper, he spoke with his uncle, remember his uncle's the king, and openly talked of the trip he must take. Now, Lord of my life, I must ask for your leave. You were witness to my wager. I have no wish to retell you the terms. They're nothing but a trifle. I must set out tomorrow to receive that stroke from the knight in green and let God be my guide. Okay, pause for a minute. Go to your notes. I've got my notes right here. Remember about knights keeping promises? Let's put the line numbers here. So like 548, 549 in, into the idea of to keep the faith or knights keeping promises. Okay. And actually, if you look at your romance elements, now he's about to leave on a quest, isn't he? He's got to go find a thing and do a thing. So that's a quest. So you could highlight your quest and put your line numbers there. Okay, let me grab my highlighter. Okay, and then we're going to go on to page 21. Ready? Sir Donadil the Dreaded, the Duke of Clarence, Lancelot, Lionel, Luke and the Good, and Sir Bors and Sir Bedivere, both big names and powerful men, such as Mador de la Porte. This courtly committee approaches the king to offer up help, heartfelt advice to our hero. So all these big knights who are used to going on quests um, are coming to give Gawain advice. And the sounds of sadness and sorrow were heard as one as worthy and well-liked as Gawain should suffer that strike, but offer no stroke in reply. He's not allowed to hit back, because that's the deal, right? Yet keeping calm, the knight just quipped, Why should I shy away? If fate is kind or cruel, a man still must try. Ooh. Isn't there something about... I'm looking at chivalry here. Yeah, finish what you start. Let's put the line numbers in there. Okay, ready? He remained all that day, and in the morning he dressed, and asked for his arms, and all were produced. Okay, when he says he asks for arms here, he doesn't mean his arms. He means his weapons. First, a rug of rare cloth was unrolled on the floor, heaped with gear which glimmered and gleamed, and onto it he stepped to receive his armored shirt, suit. He tries on his tunic of extravagant silk. Then the neatly cut cloak closed at the neck, its lining finished with a layer of white fur. Remember, because it's November, December, he's going to be traveling out in the open. He needs this to keep him warm. Then they settled his feet into steel shoes, right, because it's armor, and clad his calves, clamped them with greaves, then hinged and highly polished plates were knotted with gold thread to the knight's knees. Okay, so it's not armor that, like, clamps from front to back. Basically, it's like, almost like shin guards in soccer, right? They, they tie in or fasten at the back, because you don't have to protect your back when you're fighting people who are in front of you. So his armor basically covers his front. Then the leg guards were fitted, lagging the flesh, attached with thongs to his thick-set thighs. So he's got armor all the way up his legs now. Then comes the suit of shimmering steel, rings encasing his body and his costly clothes, well-burnished braces to both his arms, good elbow guards, and glinting metal gloves, all the trimmings and trappings of a knight tricked out to ride. A metal suit that shone, gold spurs that would gleam with pride, a keen sword swinging from the silk belt to his side. Okay, pause for a minute. Go look at your notes. Look at the elements of romance 
and the very first one we had was vivid descriptions, right? Let's put our line numbers for this section, all this description of his amazing armor. Let's put that in here, and we're going to get some more of it in a minute. Fastened in his armor, he seemed fabulous, famous, every link looking golden to the very last loop. Yet, for all that metal, he still made it to Mass, honored the Almighty before the high altar. Okay, so he's wearing his armor, and then he goes to church. Because before he's going to go on this journey, he's going to give his thanks to God, right? Okay, look at your notes. Isn't the very first one, fear God and maintain the church? So grab your highlighter. Let's highlight that one. And let's put our line numbers. Okay. After which, he comes to the king and his consorts and asks to take leave of the lords and the ladies. They escort him and kiss him and commend him to Christ. Now, Gringolet, no, not the one from Harry Potter. This is uh, his horse, Gringolet, is rigged out and ready to ride. I wonder if she did get the name from Harry Potter. Oh, for some reason I have a blank page in here. Sorry about that. With a saddle which flickered with fine golden fringes and was set with new studs for the special occasion. The bridle was bound with stripes of bright gold. The apparel of the panels was matched in appearance to the color of the saddle bows. And cropper and co cover and nails of red gold were arrayed all around, shining splendidly like splintered sunlight. Okay, so his colors are red and gold, right? And remember, the, um, the green knight was basically green everything and green and gold. These are Christmas colors, aren't they? Red and green and gold. Hmm. Look, gold fingernails just for you guys. Then he holds up his helmet and kisses it without haste. It was strongly stapled and its lining was stuffed and sat high in his forehead fastened behind with a colorful cloth to cover his neck, embroidered and bejeweled with brilliant gems on the broad silk border, and with birds on the seams, such as painted parrots perched among periwinkles, and turtle doves and true lover's knots, tightly entwined as if women had worked at it seven winters at least, all of this beautiful hand embroidery. The diamond diadem was greater still, it gleamed with flawless, flashing gems, both clear and smoked, it seemed. Then they showed him the shining scarlet shield with its pentangle painted in pure gold. So he's, his shield is red with gold paint. And it's a pentangle, which is a five-sided shape, right? So let's hear, normally you think of that and you go, ooh, sketchy supernatural stuff? Well, they're going to tell us what it all stands for in a minute. He seized it by its strap and slung it round his neck. So it's got a long strap so he can basically it can sit by his side and then he can turn it around and hold it if he needs to. He looked well in what he wore and was worthy of it. And why the pentangle was appropriate to that prince, I intend to say, although it will stall our story. Okay, so our narrator is very aware that going into this whole description about the pentangle on the shield is going to slow us down, but he thinks it's so important that to the character of who Gawain is and what he cares about, that it is worth stopping the story to explain. Okay. It is a symbol that Solomon, remember Solomon in the Bible, the wisest king, right? Once set in place and is taken to this day as a token of fealty. Ooh, wait, fealty. Fealty means loyalty. Don't we have one of our... Yep, 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 yep. Look at your... Um, chivalry, right? To keep faith. And actually a bit earlier, to live by honor and for glory. This would work for that too, because this is about honor, right? Okay. So let's highlight that one and add the page numbers. Okay, and is taken to this day as a token of fealty, fidelity. For the form of the figure is a five-pointed star, 
and each line overlaps and links with the last, so it is ever eternal. And when spoken of in England, is known by the name of the endless knot. So it's like a, a five-pointed Celtic knot. So it suits this soldier in his spotless armor, fully faithful in five ways, five times over. Pay attention to that number five. We're going to see it a lot. Five and three turn up a lot in this story. For Gawain was as good as the purest gold, devoid of vices, but virtuous, loyal, and kind. So bore that badge on both his shawl, so on his, like, on his overcoat, and shield alike. A prince who talked the truth, a notable, a knight. Okay, well, we have to speak the truth as one of his elements here, right? So let's put that, put our page number there. Okay, and here we go. He's going to go through the five. First, he was deemed flawless in his five senses. And secondly, his five fingers were never at fault, so he never did bad things. Thirdly, his faith was founded in the five wounds Christ received on the cross, as the creed recalls. And fourthly, if that soldier struggled in skirmish, one thought pulled him through above all other things, the fortitude he found in the five joys that Mary had conceived in her son, our Savior. Okay, so if you are Catholic, you know about the rosary and the different elements of the rosary and the different um, things you're supposed to think about when you pray the rosary, and one of those is the five joys of Mary, the five things that made Mary really happy. Okay, so go back to your notes and the fearing God maintaining the church. You can use the notes, you know, the page numbers here as well. And you could actually do another one on honoring women because Mary, and he's thinking about her and thinking about Mary and her joy gets him through these fights. Okay. For precisely that reason, the princely rider had the shape of her image inside his shield. Okay, so he's got that five-pointed star on the outside, and on the inside of his shield, where he can see it, he has a picture of Mary. So by catching her eye, his courage would not crack. The fifth set of five, which I heard the knight followed, included friendship and fraternity with fellow men, purity and politeness, which impressed at all times, and pity, which surpassed all pointedness. Five things which meant more to Gawain than to most men. Okay, grab your highlighter. Let's do the, um, where he's talking about friendship and fraternity and purity and politeness. Wouldn't that um, do with avoiding meanness, unfairness, and deceit? Yep, so I'm going to highlight that and put my line numbers. Okay, and if you see any others that you want to highlight and put your line numbers there, you can. So, these five sets of five were fixed in this night, each linked to the last in an endless line, a five-pointed for form which never failed. Never stronger to one side or slack at the other, but unbroken in its being from beginning to end. However, its trail is tracked and traced. So the star on the spangling shield he sported shone royally in gold on a ruby back red background, the pure pentangle as people have called it for years. Okay, so now we really know, and he's wearing, you ever, you ever heard the phrase wearing your feelings on your sleeve? You know, really everybody can kind of tell how you're feeling all the time. With Gawain, he is literally wearing, sorry I knocked my mic, literally wearing on his shield the stuff he cares about, the stuff that matters to him. So we know exactly what he's about. Then, lance in hand, held high, and got up in his gear, go back up to the next sentence. he bids them all goodbye. One final time, he fears. So he's pretty sure he's going to his death. Now, there is an irony in here, right? He just got all dressed up in all this armor, and this armor isn't going to do him any good in the fight he's going to be in because he's going to kneel down, bare his neck, and get his head cut off. 
right? So all this armor isn't going to do him any good. Spiked with the spurs, the steed sped away with such force that the firestone sparked underfoot. So just, we've got some parallelism here, right? Because the green knight did the same thing. He took off with his horse so fast that there's sparks coming out. All sighed at the sight, and with sinking hearts, they whispered their worries to one another, concerned for their comrade. A pity, by Christ, if a lord so noble should lose his life, to find his equal on earth would be far from easy. Cleverer to have acted with caution and care deemed him a duke, a title he was due, a leader of men. Lord of many lands, better than being battered into oblivion, beheaded by an ogre through headstrong pride. How unknown for a king to take the counsel of a knight in the grip of an engrossing Christmas game. So they're thinking, you know, what a shame it is he took up the game. It would be better if he just let it go. And then he, you know, had this bright future in front of him. But now he has to follow through. Warm tears welled up in their weepy eyes as gallant Sir Gawain galloped from court that day. He sped from home and hearth and went his winding way on steep and snaking paths, just as the story says. Now, through England's realm he rides and rides, Sir Gawain, God's servant, on his grim quest. Ah, uh-huh, quest. Go mark the page, the line numbers for quests. Passing long, dark nights, unloved and alone, foraging to feed, finding little to call food, with no friend but his horse through forests and hills, and only our Lord in heaven to hear him. You can really see him here, right? He's he's left the court, and we had all these great descriptions of the court and all the people and the the excitement, and and now he's out in the woods alone and he's just eating what he can find and praying and there's nobody out there to help him and there's no one out there to talk to except his horse you can really get the sense of how alone he is he wanders near to the north of Wales with the Isles of Anglesey off to the left he keeps to the coast fording each course, crossing at Holyhead and coming ashore in the wilds of the Wirral, whose wayward people both God and good men have quite given up on. So he's a little dig at the Welsh there. And he constantly inquires of those he encounters if they know, or not, in this neck of the woods, of a great green man, or a green chapel. No, they say, never, never in their lives. They know of neither a chap nor a chapel so strange. Nice bit of uh, alliteration there. Okay, so this whole thing, remember, he doesn't, he knows the green chapels, sorry, they're, they're cutting grass outside. Uh, they're, he knows the green chapels up north somewhere, but he doesn't really know where it is. And so every place he stops, he's asking people. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. doesn't this remind you of somebody else who had a quest that took a year and he was a knight and he had to go around asking people questions? Hmm. Keep that connection in mind. Okay, although Gawain doesn't do what that other knight did. He trails through bleak terrain. His mood and manner change at every twist and turn towards that chosen church. In the strange region, he scales steep slopes. He's going up mountains. Far from his friends, he cuts a lonely figure. Can't you just see him? This is cinematic. You can see him like just his silhouette up on a mountain by himself. Where he bridges a brook or wades through a waterway, ill fortune brings him face to face with a foe so foul or fierce he's bound to use force. So he's, he's encountering creatures and monsters and things and he's having to fight them because they're so strong. So momentous were his travels among the mountains that to tell just a tenth would be a tall order. Here he scraps with serpents and snarling wolves. Here he tangles with wood rows causing trouble in the crags, or with bulls and bears and the odd wild boar. Now, those of you who are hunters know how difficult wild boars can be. Hard on his heels through the highlands come giants. Only diligence and faith in the face of death will keep him from becoming a corpse or carrion. And the wars were one thing, but the winter was worse. 
And basically, this is a whole other adventure that we're just skipping here. He's fighting all these creatures and giants and monsters and animals and whatever else. But the author's like, yeah, 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 he did all that. It's fine. But the winter was worse. Imagine if you were traveling in an English winter wearing armor. What's going to be your problem? Yeah, exactly. Freezing cold. The clouds shed their cargo of crystallized rain, which froze as it fell on the frost-glazed earth. With nerves frozen numb, he napped in his armor, biovacked in the blackness among bare rocks, where meltwater streamed from the snow-capped summits, and high overhead hung chandeliers of ice. Oh, you know what this reminds me of? Yeah. Exactly, those Anglo-Saxon poetry descriptions of sailing in the ships in the winter. Yeah, good connection. So, in peril and pain, Sir Gawain made progress, crisscrossing the countryside until Christmas. Christmas Eve. Then, at that time of tiding, he prayed to highest heaven, let Mother Mary guide him toward some house or haven. Okay, so let's pause and let's look at what can we use, what can we add. We've definitely got, well, vivid descriptions. We could add some line numbers there, right? Memorable deeds, all that fighting. We could add line numbers there. Quests, definitely. Okay, adventure, yeah. Christianity, right here, so we're seeing this. Okay, so you can add in your line numbers and then come back to the video when you're ready. All right, so picking up on line 740, he's prayed to Mary for help on Christmas Eve, and so now this is Christmas Day. Next morning he moves on, skirts the mountainside, descends a deep forest, densely overgrown with ancient oaks in huddles of hundreds and vaulting hills above each half of the valley. Hazel and hawthorn are interwoven, decked and draped in damp, shaggy moss. So this is like an old, old forest with all these hills and everything sort of grown together. Bedraggled birds on bare black branches pipe pitifully into the piercing cold. Under cover of the canopy, he girded Gringalot, Gringalot through mud and marshland, a most mournful man, concerned and afraid in case he should fail in the worship of our deity, who on that date was born the virgin son to save our souls. It's Christmas Day, and he can't go to Mass because he, he's in this middle of this forest, right? And there's no safe place to be. He prayed with heavy heart, Father, hear me and Lady Mary our mother most mild, let me happen on some house where mass might be heard, and matins in the morning, meekly I ask. So he's not asking, like, I want a house where I can rest, or I want a house where I can stay. He's asking, I want a house where I can hear mass. Okay, so Christianity here, right? Put your line numbers. And here I utter my pater, pater meaning father, ave and creed, your pater would be your other, our father, your ave is your ave maria, and your creed is the, um, the apostles' creed. He rides and the path and prays, dismayed by his misdeeds, and signs Christ's cross and says, Be near me in my need. No sooner had he signed himself three times than he became aware in those woods of high walls and a moat on a mound, bordered by the boughs of thick-trunked timber that trimmed the water. A most commanding castle a knight ever kept, positioned in a site of sweeping parkland, with a palisade of pikes pitched in the earth, the midst of tall trees for two miles or more. So he, he is coming through this forest, right? And he's done the sign of the cross three times, remember that three, and suddenly there's a castle in front of him. But it's a very natural castle. Like, there's a lot of wood, there's a lot of timber, there's a lot of parkland. Just keep that in the back of your mind. 
From the corner of his eye, this castle became clearer, as it sparkled and shone with shimmering oaks. With helmet in hand, he offered thanks to Jesus and St. Julian, both gentle and good, who courteously heard him and heeded his cry. A lodging at last, so allow it, my lord. Then he girded Gringolet with his gilded spurs and purely by chance chose the principal approach to the building, which brought him to the end of the bridge with haste. The drawbridge stood withdrawn and the front gates were shut fast. Such well-constructed walls could blunt the storm wind's blast. Well, yeah, it's Christmas. Everybody who needs to be in the castle is already in the castle, right? So they've closed everything up. In the saddle of his steed, he halts on the slope of the delving moat with its double ditch. Out of the water of wondrous depth, the walls then loomed overhead to a heavenly height, course after course of crafted stone, then battlements embellished in the boldest style, and turrets arranged around the ramparts with lockable loopholes set in the lookouts. So this is a really amazing, tall, really well-designed castle. The knight had not seen a more stunning structure. Further in, his eye was drawn to a hall attended, architecturally, by many tall towers with a series of spires spiking the air, all crowned with carvings exquisitely cut. Uncountable chimneys, the color of chalk, sprouted from the roof and sparkled in the sun. So perfect was that vision of painted pinnacles clustered within the castle's enclosure. It appeared that the place was cut from paper. Okay, so the, the tops of these roofs just are so clear against the sky that it almost looks like it's a paper cutout. Then a notion occurred to the noble knight to inveigle a visit, to get invited inside, to be hosted and housed, and all the holy days remain. Responding to his call, a pleasant porter came. So he, you know, knocks on the door and calls out. A watchman on the wall, who welcomed Sir Gawain. Good morning, said our man. Oh, sorry, it was our guy. <laughs> Good morning, said our man. Will you bear a message to the owner of this hall and ask him for shelter? By St. Peter, said the porter, it'll be my pleasure, and I'm willing to bet you'll welcome a bed. Welcome to a bed. So he's like, I'm sure my guy, my, my lord, will be happy to help you. Then he went on his way, but came back at once with a group who had gathered to greet the stranger. The drawbridge came down, and they crossed the ditch and knelt in the frost in front of the knight to welcome this man in a way deemed worthy. So they see how fancy he is and how how nice he looks, and they know he's a knight, and so people come out to welcome him. Then they yielded to their guest, yanked open the gate, and bidded them to rise. He rode across the bridge. He was assisted from the saddle by several men, and the strongest among them stabled his steed, who's being really well welcomed, really well taken care of. Then knights and the squires of knights drew near to escort him with courtesy into the castle. Okay, so treating other knights with respect, right? He took off his helmet. Many hasty hands reached out to receive it and to serve this stranger, and his sword and his shield were taken aside. Then he made himself known to nobles and knights, and proud fellows pressed forwards to confer their respects. Still heavy with armor, he was led to the hall, where a fire burned bright with the fiercest flames. Then the master of the manor emerged from his chamber to greet him in the hall with all due honor. You know what this reminds me of? Making connections here. Remember when Beowulf first showed up to Hrothgar's castle and the king comes out to welcome him and he's wearing all his, like they take his sword and everything, but he's wearing all his armor? That kind of reminds me of this. Behave in my house as your heart pleases. To whatever you want, you are welcome. Do what you will. My thanks, Gawain exclaimed. May Christ reward you well. Then firmly, like good friends, they hugged and held a while. So they've got a big bear hug and greeting each other, even though they don't know each other. Gawain gazed at the Lord, who greeted him so gracefully. 
the great one who governed this grand estate, large, powerful and large in the prime of his life. With a bushy beard as red as a beaver's, steady in his stance, stolid of build, with a fiery face, but with fine conversation. A man quite capable, it occurred to Gawain, of keeping such a castle and captaining his knights. Escorted to his quarters, the Lord quickly orders that a servant be assigned to assist Gawain, and many were willing to wait on his word. Okay, we're about to get more description here. They brought him to a bedroom beautifully furnished with fine silken fabrics finished in gold, and curious coverlets lavishly quilted in bloodless ermine and embroidered to each border. So these, these bed covers are embroidered with beautiful decorations and they have ermine, which is fur, around the edge. So, because they're going to be very warm. Curtains ran on cords through red gold rings. Oh, this is very convenient, right? Remember, his colors are all red and gold and here he's being escorted into a room full of red and gold. That's not, um, that's not a coincidence, maybe? Tapestries from Toulouse and Turkestan were fixed against walls and fitted underfoot. Why would you put carpets on and tapestries on the wall? Well, remember, your walls are stone, and stone is cold, and stone echoes. So if you hang tapestries and rugs and things on the walls that are beautiful to look at, you're also warming the room and keeping the heat in. With humorous banter, Gawain was helped out of his chainmail coat and costly clothes. Then they rushed to bring him an array of robes of the choicest cloth, because it's going to be dirty, and you know, so they're bringing him nicer, cleaner clothes. He chose and changed, and as soon as he stood in that stunning gown with its flowing skirts, which suited his shape, it almost appeared to the person's present that spring, with its spectrum of colors, had sprung so alive and lean were that young man's limbs. So alive and lean were that young man's limbs. There we go. A nobler creature Christ never had never created, they declared. So they're like, he's amazing, he's beautiful, he looks fantastic, he's in this fantastic like robe, and it's amazing. This knight, whose country was unclear, now seemed to them by sight a prince without peer in fields where fierce men fight. So I don't know where he came from, but he looks pretty amazing to them. In front of a flaming fireside, a chair was pulled into place for Gawain and padded with covers and quilts all cleverly stitched. Then a cape was cast across the night of rich brown cloth with embroidered borders, finished inside with the finest furs, ermine to be exact, and a hood which echoed it. Resplendently dressed, he settled in his seat as his limbs thawed, so his lights light, thoughts lightened. Soon a table was set on sturdy trestles, covered entirely with a clean white cloth and cruets of salt and silver spoons. In a while he washed and went to his meal. Staff came quickly and served him in style, with several soups all seasoned to taste, double helpings as was fitted, and a feast of fish, some baked in bread, some browned over flames, some boiled or steamed or some stewed in spices and subtle sauces to tantalize his tongue. Four or five times he called it a feast and the courteous company happily cheered him along. On penance plates you dine, there's better board to come. The warming heady wine had freed his mind for fun. So we're getting this feasting at the end of his long, cold, lonely journey. He's finally with people again. He's feasting, he's safe. Now, through tactful talk and tentative inquiry, polite questions are put to this prince. So they want to know who he is, where he's from, right? But they're going to ask politely. He responds respectfully. Okay, we're going to pause for a minute. Because isn't one about refrain from giving offense, right? So add that, add your line numbers there. Okay, and of course you can add line numbers for the vivid description we just read. So, and he's going to tell where he's from and who he serves and all that. You know, just like Beowulf did. He responds respectfully and speaks of his journey from the court of Arthur, king of Camelot, royal royalty and ruler of the round table. And he says they now sit with Gawain himself, who has come here at Christmas time quite by chance. 
Once the master has gathered that his guest is Gawain, he thinks it's so thrilling, he laughs out loud. He's like, I've got someone here from King Arthur's court. That's awesome. I've heard of you. All the men of the manor were of the same mind, being keen and quick to appear in his presence. This person famed for prowess and purity, whose noble skills were sung to the skies, whose life was the stuff of legend and lore. They have heard of Gawain. They know who he is. So he's like a celebrity. And they're all like, oh, wow, I know who Gawain is. You know, I know what he does. Then Knight spoke softly to Knight, saying, Watch now. We'll witness his graceful ways. Hear the faultless phrasing of flawless speech. If we listen, we'll learn the merits of language, since we have in our hall a man of high honor. Ours is a generous and giving God to grant that we welcome Gawain as our guest, as we sing of his birth who was born to save us. We few shall learn a lesson here in tact and manners true, and hopefully we'll hear love's tender language too. Okay, courtly love is starting to come up there, right? So let's look at romance, and let's highlight courtly love, and we're going to see more of that in a little while. Okay, and put our line numbers here. But everybody's so impressed. This is Gawain. If we shut up and listen to him, we're going to learn everything. Once dinner was done, Gawain drew to his feet, and darkness neared as day became dusk. Chaplains went off to the castle's chapel to sound the bells hard, to signal the hour of evensong, summoning each and every soul. The Lord goes alone, then his lady arrives, concealing herself in a private pew. Gawain attends too, tugged by his sleeve he is steered to a seat, led by the Lord who greets Gawain by name as his guest. No man in the world is more welcome, are his words. For that he is thanked. And they hug there and then and sit as a pair through the service and prayer. So he gets to sit next to the, the lord of the manor, which is an honor, um, during, during mass. Then she who desired to see this stranger, so the, she's not a queen, but the lady of the manor, um, was sitting somewhere else, kind of private during mass, but now she, afterwards, she wants to come see him. Came from her closet with her sisterly crew, so she was sitting with women. She was fairest amongst them, her face, her flesh, her complexion, her quality, her bearing, her body, more glorious than Guinevere. Ooh. We were told Guinevere was the best of the best, right? Or so Gawain thought. And in the chancel of the church, they exchanged courtesies. Okay, the chancel's like the entryway to the church. So this is after mass. They're standing like, like often you do, right? You leave church and you kind of stand around in front and talk to people. She was hand in hand with a lady to her left, someone altered by age, an ancient dame, well respected, it seemed, by the servants at her side. Those ladies were not a bit alike. One woman was young, one withered by years. The body of the beauty seemed to bloom with blood. The, so, you know, she's got a very pink cheeks. The cheeks of the crone were waddled and slack. So like when old people get really kind of thin and their cheeks kind of fold. One was clothed in a kerchief clustered with pearls which shone like snow, snow on the slopes of her upper breast and bright bare throat. So she's like, She's got beautiful gems coming down from her headdress and like her throat is bare. You know, she's got bare skin here. The other was clothed in, uh, no, I'm sorry. The other was noosed and knotted at the neck, her chin enveloped in chalky white veils, her forehead fully enfolded in silk. So her headdress kind of comes and covers everything and comes up high on her neck and you can't really see any of her skin. With detailed designs on the edges and hems, Nothing bare except the black of her brows and the eye and nose and her naked lips. So basically like her headdress covers everything but her face, which were chapped and bleared in a sorrowful sight. A grand old mother, a matriarch, she might be hailed. Her trunk was square and squat, her buttocks bulged and swelled. Most men would sooner squint at her though whose hand she held. So there's this kind of old ugly lady, but respectful and her servants seem to respect her and she's honored she's just kind of old and ugly um, and then there's this young beautiful woman who Gawain would quite like to look at thank you very much 
Then Gawain glanced at the gracious-looking woman, and by leave of the Lord he approached the ladies, and saluting the elder with a long, low bow, so he, he bowed to the old lady, holding the other for a moment in his arms, kissing her respectfully, and speaking with courtesy, so he hugs and kisses the young woman. They request his acquaintance, and quickly he offers to serve them unswervingly, should they say the word. Okay, pause for a minute. Honor women in your notes. Let's put these line numbers in with honoring women. They take him between them and talk as they walk to a hearth full of heat. So he's got like the older lady on one side and the younger lady on the other, and they're all walking together to go get more, well, more food and go sit in front of the fire and hurriedly ask for specially spiced cakes, which are speedily fetched, and wine filled each goblet again and again. Frequently the Lord would leap to his feet, insisting that mirth and merriment be made. Well, much like Arthur, right? The, the guy who runs the castle, the Lord, you know, wants some fun stuff. Bring me some music, bring me some stories. Hauling off his hood, he hoisted it on a spear, a prize, he promised, to the person providing most comfort and cheer at Christmas time. And my fellows and friends shall help in my fight to see it hangs but from no head but my own. So he takes his hood off and hangs it up and says, whoever comes up with the best, most fun thing is going to get to wear the hood. And I want to come up. I want to be the best. So the laughter of that lord lights up the room and Gawain and the gathering are gladded by games till late. So they all stay up late playing games and having fun. So late, his lordship said, that lamps should burn with light. Then blissful, bound for bed, Sir Gawain waved good night. Right, so it was a great Christmas for him, right? So the morning dawns when man remembers the day our Redeemer was born to die, and every house on earth is joyful for Lord Jesus. Their day was no different, being a diary of delights. Banquets and buffets were beautifully cooked and dutifully served to diners on the dais. The ancient elder sat highest at the table with the Lord, I believe, in the chair to her left. The sweeter one and Gawain took seats in the center and were first at the feast to dine. So again, we're seeing like who's most important and they're all up on this main stage. Then food was carried around as custom decrees and served to each man as his status deserved. So just like it was in Arthur's court, right? There was feasting, there was fun, and such feelings of joy as could not be conveyed by quick description. Yet to tell it in detail would take too much time. But I'm aware that Gawain and the beautiful woman found such comfort and closeness in each other's company, through warm exchanges of whispered words and refined conversation free from foulness, that their pleasure surpassed all princely sports by far. Beneath the din of drums, men followed their affairs, and trumpets thrilled and thrummed as those two tended theirs. Okay, so he to Gwaine and this beautiful lady who's married to the lord of the castle just hit it off, right? So they're talking, they're having a good time, they're enjoying each other's company. It's just great. And if you remember, he was a little bit removed from from Guinevere like he knew she was beautiful but she really wasn't someone he could talk to and this lady being a lady of the manor and still very respectable but not a queen you know he really he's really hitting it off and they're having a great time and they're becoming best friends they drank and danced all day and the next and danced and drank the day after that and then St. John's Day passed with a gentler joy as the Christmas feasting came to a close Guests were to go in the grayness of dawn as they laughed and dined, as the dusk darkened, swaying and swirling to music and song. If this sounds familiar, it should, right? Isn't this exactly what happened the previous year at the castle? Then, at last, in the lateness, they upped and left toward distant parts along different paths. Gawain offered his goodbyes, but was ushered by his host to his host's own chamber and the heat of his chimney waylaid by the Lord, so the Lord might thank him profoundly and profusely for the favor he had shown in honoring his house at that hallowed season and lighting every corner of the castle with his character. As long as I live, my life shall be better that Gawain was my guest at God's own feast. So the Lord is like, thank you for honoring us with your presence at Christmas time, right? And Gawain's like, you guys came as an answer to prayer. 
By God, said Gawain, but the gratitude goes to you. May the high king of heaven repay your honor. Your requests are now this knight's commands. I am bound by your bidding. No boon is too high to say. At length, his lordship tried to get his guest to stay. But proud Gawain replied, he must now make his way. So Gawain's like, look, I got to go. I got to go. And then the lord, being curious, made a courteous inquiry of what desperate deed in the depth of winter should coax him from Camelot so quickly and alone before Christmas was over in his king's court. So why are you even out here? What do you have to hurry off to? It's the middle of winter. There's nothing going on. What you ask, said the knight, you shall now know. A most pressing matter prized me from that place. I myself am summoned to seek out a site, and I have not the faintest idea where to find it. But find it I must, by the first of the year, and not fail for all the acres in England. So help me, Lord. And in speaking of my quest, I respectfully request that you tell me, in truth, if you have heard the tale of a green chapel, or the grounds where a green chapel stands, or the guardian of those grounds who is colored green. For I am bound by a bond agreed by us both to link up with him there, should I live that long. As day dawns on New Year's Day draws near, if God sees fit, I shall face that freak more happily than I would the most wondrous wealth. With your blessing, therefore, I must follow my feet. In three short days my destiny is due, and I would rather drop dead from def- than default from duty. Okay, so let's go to our notes. The finishing what you start, big deal, right? And you could add um, the line numbers there that he'd rather die than not fulfill his promise. Okay, then laughing out loud, the Lord said, relax, I'll direct you to your rendezvous when the time is right. You'll get to the green chapel, so give up your grieving. You can bask in your bed, bide your time, save your fond farewells till the first of the year, and still meet him mid-morning to do as you may. So stay. A guide will get you there at dawn on New Year's Day. The place you need is near, two miles at most away. So he's like, oh, it's just around the corner. (laughs) You, You can stay as long as you want and still get there on time. I know exactly where it is. I'll send a guy to show you. Well, remember, this is huge, right? Gawain did, had no idea where it was, and now he knows, and now he knows he's almost there, and he doesn't have to go wandering. Then Gawain was giddy with gladness and declared, For this, more than anything, I thank you thoroughly. Now my sight is set, and I'll stay in your service until that time, attending every task. So I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll help you with anything, because you have helped me. The Lord squeezed Gawain's arm and seated him at his side and called for the ladies to come keep them company. There was pleasure of plenty in their private talk. The lips of the Lord ran wild with words, like the mouth of a madman not knowing his mind. Then, speaking to Gawain, he suddenly shouted, "'You've sworn to serve me, whatever I instruct. "'Will you hold to that oath right here and now?' "'You may trust my tongue,' said Gawain, in truth." For within these walls I am servant to your will. The Lord said warmly, You were weary and worn, hollow with hunger, harried by tiredness, yet you join in my reveling right royally every night. You relax as you like, lie in your bed till mass tomorrow, then go to your meal where my wife will be waiting, she'll sit at your side to accompany and comfort you in my absence from court. So lounge, at dawn I'll rise and ride and hunt with horse and hound. The gracious knight agreed, and bending low, he bowed. Furthermore, said the master, let's make a pact. Here's a wager. What I win in the woods will be yours, and what you gain while I'm gone, you will give to me. Young sir, let's swap and strike a bond. Let a bargain be a bargain, for better or for for worse or for better. By God, said Gawain, I agree to the terms, and I find it pleasing that you favor such fun. You think Gawain would have learned, right? This whole trade for trade thing. He hasn't learned a thing. Okay. Let drink be served and we'll seal the deal, the Lord cried loudly and everyone laughed. 
So they reveled and caroused uproariously these lords and ladies for as long as they liked, and when they tired and slowed, they stood and then spoke with immaculate exchanges of manners and remarks. And with parting kisses, the party dispersed, footmen going forward with flaring torches, and every lord was led at last to bed to dream. Before they part, the pair re repeat their pact again. That lord was well aware of how to host a game. Okay, so here's the game. Here's the deal. The game. The lord is going to go out hunting in the morning. And whatever he hunts, he's going to give to Gawain. Okay. Gawain is going to relax in the castle all day long. Go to mass, have dinner, and talk to the, talk to the lady. Just relax. And whatever he gets during the day, he's going to give back to the lord. It's a trade for a trade. Okay, I'm going to tell you now, Gawain is being set up, and you'll see how in a few minutes, okay? All right, this ends fit two. So, pause. Let's add to your notes wherever we can add. For example, the um, finishing what you start, we could add this, like never refuse a challenge from an equal, which he's doing again here, right? Obeying those in authority. So you can add all kinds of stuff here. And then pause, and you're going to go into Schoology and do your discussion questions. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time.